night of total terror. Night of the living dead, the dead who live on living flesh. The dead whose haunted souls hunt the living. The living whose bodies are the only food for these ungodly creatures. <laughs> in fear, an experience in shock more shattering than your strangest nightmare, night of the living dead, a night with the dead who cannot die, a night of total terror. Night. Of the living dead. Welcome to the latest episode of the B-Movie Club. I'm your host, Kevin. This will be discussing the 1968 horror classic, Night of the Living Dead, starring some relatively unknown actors and zombies, directed by George Romero. For those of you joining us for the first time, each week on the B-Movie Club, I discuss certain guilty pleasures and forgotten classics of the past. You can go ahead and go to our page on Facebook, Original B-Movie Club, and give us the big thumbs up. You can also go to our page on YouTube, KD9575, hit the subscribe button, it's totally free. You can also go to uh, Twitter and follow me there at the B-Movie Club. You do these things, you'll get the latest updates whenever I post a new video, anytime I find a funny article or picture or news, anything at all, I'll just pass it right on, you'll be the first to know. So, don't forget to spread the word, tell all your friends, neighbors, enemies, etc, etc, etc. Night of the Living Dead. The movie opens at a cemetery. Young Barbara and her brother Johnny are visiting the grave of their dearly departed father. While they're there, a kind of shambling dude comes across the, uh, the cemetery and attacks them. Uh, Johnny fights with him. They go down. But then here he comes shambling after Barbara. Barbara runs off. Uh, she makes her way to the countryside where she sees like a farmhouse. Rushes there. Closes the door, um, locks it all up, notices that there's now a couple shambling guys outside there. She's basically a nervous wreck. They've established Barbara very early on as kind of being kind of childish. I don't know if she was like sheltered or because she's afraid of a lot of little things, but now she has reason to be afraid. But she's like basically goes into shock. She's like throughout most of the movies, so get used to the, or she's just kind of. <laughs> Uh, soon after, a truck pulls up, and we see Ben, kindly guy. Uh, he uh, fights off some zombies, which we know they're zombies now. At the beginning of the movie, we just think they're just, I don't know, homeless drifters? I don't know what they are. He breaks in, tries to talk to Barbara. She's still doing her I'm in a coma uh, routine. He boards up the house. Um, while he's doing this, a door that we hadn't seen, spoiler alert, opens up. And there's people down below. There's a basement area, a cellar, if you will. And in there, we see the Coopers, husband and wife. Uh, we see another young couple down there. Um, evidently, the Coopers have their daughter as well. But she's not doing so hot because she was, when they were driving along, I guess they were on vacation or something, uh, the zombies knocked over their car and bit the little girl. Not enough to kill her, but uh, she's hurt. Um, so it's very sad. There's immediate tension, if you will, between Ben and Mr. Cooper. They both have different ideas about what they should do. Ben's attitude is like, 
let's board up the house until we can, because there's a gas tank out front. Let's board up the house until we can get a moment to find the keys to the gas tank, fill up my truck or whatever, and then we can all go to one of the safe places. Evidently, uh, news reports start coming out. Uh, telling people that the dead are rising and attacking people because initially they thought it was just like a crime wave of crazy killers But now they know people are returning from the grave and killing people so and then if you die you become a Zombie as well, but they first they tell people stay inside keep your doors locked now. They're saying Leave those places and come to these kind of safe community areas where the National Guard is there They have medical supplies and blah blahs so, that's what Ben wants to do. Mr. Cooper is like, you guys are all crazy, we should all be down in the cellar. If you don't come with me now, I'm going to lock the cellar and I'm not, I'm not opening it for any reason. So there's a lot of tension. Eventually, uh, they find the keys to uh, the, the gas pump because it's locked. Ben formulates this plan, we'll go. Um, the young couple will come with me, I guess. We'll go and get the gas, we'll come back and rescue everybody. Mr. Cooper reluctantly agrees to go along with it. His job is to throw these Molotov cocktails down on the zombies. Zombies don't like bright light and fire, they're like, ah. So he'll distract them. Um, ben and the young guy will go out to the car, jump in the car, and go get the gas. I can't remember the young guy. I keep calling him the young guy and young girl. Uh, they, <laughs> they both get in the car. They both drive to the gas tank. They begin to, <laughs> they find the keys, don't unlock it, which is bizarre because literally they said that the keys had the word like gas can or gas tank or whatever it was, pump perhaps. Uh, so they use a rifle, which Ben found in one of the closets to blow the lock off. Um, Tommy or Billy or whatever his name is, I don't recall. This is the kind of hard hitting analysis you get on this show. The, the, the serious research you get. He, I don't know if he's never operated a gas pump before, or if he's got the palsy or something, or he's just got a... He pulls the, the pump out and immediately just starts spraying gasoline all over the place. I don't know. I can't explain it. He was, he was going for the tank, but he, he's like, I gotta prep, pull the trigger before we get there, so now there's gas all over the car. Now here's a problem. Ben was carrying a torch uh, with him to kind of ward off the zombies. He put the torch on the ground to help unlock the thing. So when Billy or Tommy or Brad or whatever his name is starts spraying the gas, of course, now there's fire everywhere. The car catches on fire and they decide, okay, we got to get, let's drive the truck out. A young guy jumps, jumps in the car. He's like, we got to get the truck away from the pump. He starts driving away. Meanwhile, Ben is like, why are you leaving? I've got this thing almost put out. I found a rug in the back. Give me two seconds. But they've already driven off. Okay, so now they're far enough away from the pump. Tommy's like, hey, Sally or Angie or whatever your name is, let's get out of here. Of course, her jacket's caught, so he goes back for her. Boom. Now there's no more truck, no more young couple.
can see why I forgot their name, because they blow up. So, it's neither here nor there. So now Ben is off by himself, uh, very far from the farmhouse, surrounded by a hundred zombies. This is bad. I don't want to spoil everything. I don't want to give it all away. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of drama. There's a lot of stuff going on here. I'm assuming most of you have seen this, but, you know, keep a little mystery. Uh, this movie was filmed in the Pittsburgh area by uh, the man who would eventually become the horror legend, George Romero. Interestingly enough, him and his cohorts, who uh, were kind of movie people, they had aspirations to become, get in the movie business, were actually working on Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, if you remember that, which was also filmed in the Pittsburgh area. So they were working on that. They say Fred Rogers was a great guy. Um, eventually they started working on like commercials and industrial films before they eventually wrote up a script uh, that would eventually become Night of the Living Dead. So they're working on the script and at one point it was going to be a horror comedy, it was going to be called uh, like Monster Flick and it was going to have more to do with aliens coming down and eating corpses, something like that. Yeah, sounds like a laugh riot, doesn't it? So Romero and his writing partner, a, a gentleman named Russo, were working on the script. Eventually they junked that and said, well, we can't afford aliens and all this other stuff. Um, but we can't afford just having guys kind of stumble around wearing, you know, rags and things like that. We can afford that. That's on our budget. So George Romero wrote um, what, a three-part story, which eventually became Night of the Living Dead, and then it's two sequels, Dawn of the Dead and Day of the Dead. So they shot it. Uh, basically had all their buddies involved, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the actors in the movies are also people who did other jobs, like they were editors, they were producers, you know, they were, they were trying to uh, conserve as much cash. Meanwhile, a lot of people wanted to be in the movie, a lot of their uh, people in the, in the greater Pittsburgh area were like, hey, we don't get a lot of movies filmed out there, so local TV personalities came and participated, kind of donated their time. Uh, they got like 100 people out there just to be zombies walking around. So, that's pretty cool. The character of Ben was particularly interesting because this is 1967-68 uh, during civil rights era, essentially. Uh, and the part of Ben was not written with any particular race or color in mind. And when the actor Dwayne Jones came in to read for the part of Ben, he's an African-American actor, George Romero said we weren't necessarily trying to, uh, you know, send a message or prove a point, although they were aware of those things and had opinions on them. But they just said he was the best. He was the best actor for the part. And he gave the best reading, he had the best audition, so we cast him. Boom. Um, and they, they even said, after we cast an African-American actor, we felt like it's better not to change anything. Why would you change it, change the part or change the dialogue or whatever to accommodate uh, an actor? Because it's just an actor, right? So, but, however, the actor, Dwayne Jones, he was very aware of being kind of uh, an African-American uh, actor in a lead role, ostensibly the hero of the, of the movie, and how that would be perceived. So he had opinions on the way things should be handled. And for the most part, they, they uh, followed those opinions. They went along with it. Um, so that's kind of interesting. After they made the movie... Um, they tried to go out and get distributed, but a lot of people weren't interested in having it uh, and, and paying for it. Or, because, spoiler alert, the ending is not a happy ending. Certain distributors were like, well, if you change the ending to make it more upbeat, then we're interested. And they said, uh, negative Ghost Rider. We like it the way it is. We, you know, we have uh, a certain point of view we're telling with this. Uh, so no can do. Now, originally, the movie was going to be called Night of the Flesh Eaters. So when they did the, the title sequence, it said Night of the Flesh Eaters, uh, trademark, or registered trademark, or whatever. When they decided that name kind of sucks, we're going to change it to Night of the Living Dead, it has more punch, they, for, they forgot to include the trademark symbol. So by virtue of that, the movie, from the moment it was released, was on open domain, public domain. It was like, now anybody could go out and show this movie and not pay any royalties to Romero and his people. So that's not good. So literally overnight, boom, it's shown across Europe, it's on midnight shows uh, throughout the country. Uh, more recently, it's like if you go on Amazon and say, I want to buy Night of the Living Dead, 
on Blu-ray or DVD or whatever, um, there are like a, a myriad of companies that have a copy that they're trying to sell you. Because anything goes. So what are you going to do? It's very sad for them. They, did, they didn't make a lot of money. They made some money, but again, they, they weren't able to determine how much uh, revenue was actually coming based upon their movie. They tried to sue the distribution company, who they felt was the ones who screwed it up, and they went bankrupt. So they didn't get any money from that either. It's very sad. Another thing that's kind of funny about this movie, it's really not that violent, you know, by today's standards. Now, it might have been, and I'm sure it was, particularly violent for that era. But if you watch, you know, if you watch um, even D uh, Dawn of the Dead that came out eight years later, it's like night and day. I mean, most of the time you see uh, the people fighting the zombies. I'm just kind of grabbing them and taking them off. The only time you really see them actually eating stuff uh, is after Tommy and Susie in the, in the truck blow, when it blows up is we see them like eating ostensibly the, their remains. So it's a lot of I have like a I have a leg bone and I'm chewing on. Um, and they actually had a butcher who was one of the cast members, one of the zombies. He donated a bunch of meats and things like that. Uh, and they, because it was a black and white movie, they didn't. They just used chocolate syrup for blood. So you had people eating like slabs of meat. Okay, I'm, I'm assuming from a cow, perhaps, with chocolate syrup over it. And even George Romero in interviews just like, I don't know how they ate that stuff. Like <laughs> they're like, I'm not eating that. So. It's, it's serious business. It's serious business. What can I tell you? Um, now, I haven't mentioned this before, but this is important. George Romero, with this movie, redefined horror as we know it. Um, there had been zombie movies in the past, like White Zombie with like Bela Lugosi, things like that. But most of the time, they were kind of voodoo, right? There's a voodoo guy who's casting a spell, and now there's somebody just kind of walking around like this. But they... He took some things, uh, George Romero took aspects of that, but mainly the main thing he took it from was from a story called I Am Legend by Richard Matheson, which was about uh, kind of a hero held up uh, in a, you know, a fortress kind of thing with a world of vampires trying to get in and get at him. So he took that and changed it from vampires to this new conception of what he called ghouls which are, they're, they're dead people coming back from the grave, and they eat you. They want to eat you. So that's a whole new thing. That, that had never really existed uh, prior to this movie. In a couple places in literature, uh, if you read some H.P. Lovecraft, you might see a little something there. But again, this was the first one where it wasn't, it was here's dead people eating, trying to get you and eat you. Uh, but it's not voodoo. In fact, they didn't uh, really didn't establish what the cause was. So if you see, even today, if you see any zombie movies, almost 100% of the time there's no reason given why the zombies are, are rising from the grave. They just, we don't know. Because I guess then they're thinking, if this was to happen in the real world, there wouldn't be some uh, grand moment where they're like, oh, well, here's where it is. Here's the, you know, the satellite from Venus brought radiation. So, interesting. They didn't feel compelled to talk about that. And even George Romero now is just kind of like, eh, not a big deal. You know, they felt it added kind of a scary aspect to it. Now here's something else that I think is kind of interesting. Um, after Night of the Living Dead, George Romero made a variety of uh, zombie movies. Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, more recently, Land of the Dead, Diary of the Dead, Survival of the Dead, a few other things in there. But you notice that only the first movie is Night of the Living Dead. After that, he didn't say Dawn of the Living Dead. And there was some kind of friction between who should get how much credit for writing the script between Romero and his partner at the time, Russo. Um, so they went their, separate uh, went their separate ways. And for some reason, Russo got the rights to Living Dead. So if you see a movie where it's talking about the living dead, you'll notice that those are kind of non-canon, if you will. They're kind of doing their own thing. And that started in the mid-80s with Return of the Living Dead, where they mentioned Night of the Living Dead, but it adds like, oh, well, you know, that was a movie, but 
they kind of messed up the, the real things that happened, blah, 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 blah. And that's the first one where they talk about brains, brains. So, more recently, they had Children of the Living Dead. <laughs> they actually did a remake of Night of the Living Dead. There were a few remakes of Night of the Living Dead. Uh, so, but there was a little bit of a schism there between these two, these two people. So, there you have it. Good times had by all. Um, I love this movie. I was talking to somebody about this. It's a great movie. It's a little dated. Um, again, 1967-68. Uh, but it's definitely a genre-defining film. And, you know, if you watch Walking Dead, I talked to my wife about this. It's like, the violence you see in Walking Dead is, is, is about as, as rough as you're going to see in, in most of these zombie movies. And it was, it's far more violent than uh, the original Night of the Living Dead. In my opinion. But I enjoy it. If you've never seen it, I highly recommend it. When Another interesting fact about this. When this movie first came out, initially horror movies were released kind of on Saturday matinees for kids. Horror movies were considered child's fare. And they weren't considered that, uh, you know, anything too serious. I mean, a lot of Wolfman and, you know, uh, Frankenstein, stuff like that. So people would drop their kids off to go watch a bunch of horror movies the way they did, you know, went shopping or whatever they did back in the day. Um, and so they did that with Night of the Living Dead. And Roger Ebert was at one of these matinees about to write his review. And he said he could say it was like a palpable change as this movie went on. Like kids didn't know, literally didn't know what hit them. I guess not literally. No one came out and hit them. Figuratively didn't know what hit them. Um, because it was something, the violence and the, the zombies and the kind of sense of dread was something entirely new. I mean, they interviewed some of these kids like modern day and they said they basically went home and couldn't go to sleep that night you know <laughs> were having accidents in their bed because they didn't want to get out of bed in case there was a zombie walking down the hall this is serious business this movie currently has a 96 percent fresh on rotten tomatoes so if you have not seen it and you're kind of into the whole zombie thing i highly recommend it check it out um <laughs> next week I'm moving away from the horror genre. We're going to be heading straight for the western action genre. The classic Tombstone, starring Val Kilmer, Kurt Russell, Michael Bean. It's an all-star cast. Powers Booth is in this one. Sam Elliott, Bill Paxton, the list goes on and on. Anywho, so check that out. It is currently streaming instantly on Netflix, along with Night of the Living Dead. Check it out. Send me any favorite scenes, favorite quotes, comments, or questions, and I might just talk about it on the show. I might, or I might not. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I make no promises. Uh, don't forget to go to our page on Facebook, Original B Movie Club. Don't forget to go to our page on YouTube, KD9575. And don't forget to follow me on Twitter at The B Movie Club. As you know, I end every episode with a totally out of context quote. And here it is. Yeah. They're dead. They're all messed up. <laughs> oh, good times. I could have also gone with, They're coming to get you, Barbara. Good times had by all. So thank you for joining us next week. Night of... Uh, not Night of Living Dead. That's this week. Next week is Tombstone. Which I guess... There's a reason for confusion. There's Night of Living Dead and there's Tombstones. Not connected. Have nothing to do with each other. So thank you for joining us and be well. Uh -huh.